Good afternoon, folks. Thanks for uh, joining Rebecca and I to talk a bit about uh, catalytic leadership and what role chambers play in moving their communities forward. <clears throat> you know, we've been uh, talking about this question about the difference that chambers can make in their communities for a long time. It actually was the basis for the whole Horizon initiative that came out of ACCE a couple of years ago. And I think what we, we've also found in this conversation about making changes in our community is to the ongoing and long-term role that chambers play in their community and frankly how consistent the presence of the Chamber of Commerce in those communities is and the reason that that makes Chambers of Commerce really the perfect place to be change agents for the good things that can happen in your community. So we at the Chamber here in Omaha have a vision statement that says that we're a catalyst organization. And we use that to, to forewarn board members, um, even potential staff and members, that if they're joining an organization that pretends to be a, a catalyst, that means that we're all about change, trying to figure out how we can change as an organization or change the community for the better, um, basically make changes that will move the community to a place where it isn't today where we all want it to be. So then we got to a point where we tried to figure out how do we define what that direction is. <clears throat> you know, we do, a, for years and years and years, we have done a strategic planning effort here every five years to help fund our economic development effort. And the way we've done that is probably the way most of you do strategic planning. We've looked back the last five years, see what we've got done, figure out those things that we want to do better at, and so enhance the program of work a bit, maybe figure out those things that didn't work so well, or maybe that were outmoded and take them off the agenda, and then potentially put some things on the agenda that might reflect some current issues or challenges that the community is facing, facing so that those strategic plans for the next five years were more relevant. So we would go through that process, and every five years we would accomplish our goals, and then figure out how aggressive the executive committee or the board or our funders wanted us to be, and develop the next five-year plan. And we never really figured out anything other than were we actually accomplishing the goals that we set. But we never actually put a marker out there five or 10 or 15 or 20 years and said, we're doing all this work so that we can go to that particular point. <clears throat> about uh, four or five years ago, I had a staffer who said, wouldn't it be great, David, if as we were doing our strategic plan, that we got everybody else doing their strategic plan at the same time, and we all agreed on where we were headed. Wouldn't that make a difference in how philanthropy is invested, how businesses invest their money, how the chamber program would work, how we would partner or collaborate with other people? And I remember looking at Jamie, who was our staff person at the time, and saying, boy, that's a really great idea, but I have no clue how we can get there. Because as you know, if there's 15 organizations in a community and all of us are doing strategic planning, and all of us are trying to improve what we've done the year before, but there's no correlation between what those 15 organizations are trying to accomplish in the community, then it could be that all 15 organizations are actually working across purposes to each other. How do we get these organizations to a place where we all recognize what we're trying to accomplish and then each of our individual agendas are implemented in such a way that we're trying to accomplish that common goal? <clears throat> so we've been, we started hunting around for a method for us to engage in. The chambers, our next chamber of five-year economic development strategy um, needed to be developed in 2017 so that we could go raise money in 2018 for a 2019 through 2024 implementation cycle. And so we were able to, after many conversations with Rebecca Ryan at Next Generation Consulting, um, start talking about work that she's been doing in the futurist world and did it make sense for us to start thinking about economic development as a long-term goal, a target, if you will, rather than a series of five-year plans where we just show incremental improvement in output from a quantity perspective, and not necessarily a quality perspective, and moving the community in directions mm -hmm. we wanted to move it. So we started talking to our, our volunteers, and they got intrigued by the notion of actually using a futurist to help us through this process. And so after some discussions with Rebecca, we also reached out to the Urban League of Nebraska, which is one of our partners here in town that we work with on primarily workforce development issues. 
and Unite Way of the Midlands, which is another partner here that we work with on education and workforce and diversity issues. And we asked them to come to the table with us and to partner in developing a 20-year future plan, which then we would all use as a guidepost for us to kind of do some back planning, which Rebecca here will talk about here in a second. It says, if we want to accomplish something 20 years in the future, how do we figure out what steps we have to take today in order to accomplish that future? So we built this strategy, we built, excuse me, a structure, got our partners, started talking to investors and board members, and before we knew it, we had agreed on a deal with Rebecca where she would become Greater Omaha's futurist in residence for most of 2017. She started here uh, in February, I think, about three days a month um, with a whole host of things that I'm sure she'll describe here as part of her process, but basically leading us in a community in a really interesting scenario of trying to figure out what our preferred future could look like 20 years from now, and then what steps do we have to take to accomplish that now, and then in the future five-year segments as well. So for us, it's been terrific. We have just presented today to our executive committee um, the proposed five-year strategy for economic development. It will be presented to our board on Friday, and even more importantly, the preferred future that we developed together with the United Way and the Urban League will be presented to more than 800 people at our annual Economic Outlook luncheon tomorrow um, as an indication of where the future economy is going in this community. So I believe it's worked wonders for us. Uh, it's also worked wonders for other, other organizations in the community, and I'm sure Rebecca will talk about that as she goes through this process. So without further ado, let me introduce Rebecca to, t to talk about the process we've gone through and then we'll be able to answer questions for you folks when we get closer to the end. Yeah, right on. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, you guys all know, I mean, this is a very special leader who I'm sitting next to. For those of you who have your cameras on, you can, I think you can kind of see us. Um, so uh, we'll be back in just a second to do some Q&A. Um, but I do want to walk you through, you know, what this is. What is strategic foresight? David, you gave a really good kind of nod to the Horizons report. Um, not both of us. He's much more handsome than I. So, um, so what is strategic foresight? Um, you know, David laid it out really well. It's a way of looking at the future um, in a really systematic way. Um, and not only at the future that could be, because the future scares a lot of people, but also to look at it in a way of like, okay, what's that preferred future? What does that preferred future look like? And so the images that I like to kind of toggle this between is, you all know what strategic planning is. David said he was just at the Metro Council uh, meeting, Metro, major metros? Metro cities. Right? Metro cities meeting for ACCE. And you know, you guys are always working on planning, always working on planning. And I think the big difference is the, the first point of orientation. So in foresight, we take a long look. We say, all right, what do we think this region, in this case, the greater Omaha region, what do we think this is going to look like in 20 years' time? What do we want it to look like, and then how do we backcast to today? Whereas strategic planning traditionally looks at last year's work statement and then says, all right, how do we do that a little bit better, faster, cheaper? What do we stop doing? What do we keep doing, right? And I think you can all understand where strategic planning works really good if you're in this left-hand column where things are stable and clear and there are no changes that are going to be anticipated. And I remember in David's and my first discussions, one of the things that he put on the table is that there will be major changes in this community's philanthropic um, environment. I mean, you know, Warren Buffett is the name that everybody, you know, links to Omaha. And, you know, he's not getting younger. And as you think about him and his peers who have become sort of these Berkshire millionaires and billionaires, they have left an amazing legacy in this community. And that may change when their kids take over, when their grandkids take over. So that's one thing that we know in the future of this region will probably be different. How different, we're not sure, but different, right? So you know, then you think about how the economy is changing and you think about how the political landscape is changing. And what you quickly realize is that we are in a VUCA, that's the military word, this acronym VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. We're in a different world. And so what I would say is strategic planning works great if you're living on the left-hand side of this column, right? If things are simple and clear, then absolutely just do everything you've done in the past and do it just a little bit better. But if you're having any kind of 
disruption or ambiguity, taking a look at the long-term future, looking into the future, being analytical about the trends that are happening, really having hard conversations about what could happen in this community if this happened, that's when foresight can be very useful. Because one of the things that um, I think foresight does well, um, and I saw it in a couple in a couple different ways in this community. One of the things I think foresight does well is it takes some of the fear out of the future. Because when you really sit down with a bunch of leaders and you talk about the top 12 trends or whatever that are impacting the region and how do we need to measure those and, and what can we do proactively, then the boogeyman disappears. Uh, it stops being something that everybody worries about and it starts being something that people can be planful, you know, planful and mindful of. So that's where foresight fits, um, taking this long-term view in an environment that might be a little bit ambiguous and unclear. Um, and then we just follow the wheel. Uh, we futurists are not known for our super sexy branding. Um, so this right here is the foresight wheel. That's as good as it gets. That is it. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. He knows, right? And so we did this whole process um, in Omaha. We started with step one in the 12 o'clock position. The domain that we looked at was Greater Omaha in 2040, specifically our economy. What is our economy going to be in 2040? We walked all the way around this. And for those of you who are nerds, you'll see that this is actually seven steps, not six because uh, step three has a part A and a part B. Um, and, you know, tomorrow we really start with step six. Well, probably Friday when your board gets to look at the whole I thing. I bless it. That's right. That's yeah. right. So um, we've gone through this entire process. And, um, I, you know, I want to talk about just a couple of things quickly. Um, one is, <clears throat> I mean, David took a huge risk not just because I'm a risky person to run with, but also, you know, while, while David was working on sort of this 20-year plan for the community with a process that had never been used here before, so that's its own risk, with, dip, with partners that are not traditional partners in most parts of the country. This is the only place in the country where the Urban League, the United Way, and the Chamber have co-planned uh, together. Um, but the other risk was, David said, we're also going to make Rebecca available to anybody in the community who wants to do foresight. And one of the things that was shocking was the demand <laughs> was insane. So there are 38, at last count, 38 different organizations from the utility to Werner Trucking, which is a billion dollar, you know, Fortune 1000 company, to... Um, to the to the community foundation who said we do we want a futurist to come and help us think about our future. So the unintended cool thing about the, this residency has been that not only does David have a future forward look at what's coming and how to get there, but he also has hundreds of people who speak this same language around these, you know, seven steps of the wheel that's on your screen right now. We can talk about that a little bit more later, but it's it's really been it's been something. So um, now, how did we get at this preferred future? How do we get at this preferred future? Well, we did it by looking at eleven possible futures for the community of this region. Uh, everything from kind of dis disruption or disasters um, to amazing things, like if if some really big economic development deals went through, how would that change the community? And what we landed on was. Regardless of what future comes, there are some things that the Chamber and its partners must do aggressively and ambitiously if it wants to have the future that it thinks it can have, that preferred future. And um, I'm going to just share this. This is kind of a little hack. Uh, but I know that there are some people on this call who are at Futurist Camp. And you know, we always talk at Camp, uh, Futurist Camp, we always talk about the power of story that when you're trying to get your community to think about the future, the science shows us that if you can tell a story, it can actually change people's beliefs about what's possible. So what we did in Omaha is we wrote a story about a preferred future. And, um, you know, I'm just thinking about your VP of Economic Development who was like, I had to read this thing twice. Like, I did not get it. Because it doesn't read like a strategic plan, right? We wrote a story about in 20 years, if we got all these things right, what could it look like? But it has really gone on to spur so much creativity in the staff, in the partners, 
in in thinking about um, who the who this future is gonna is gonna impact, and it has people leaning in like they can see it, and therefore they can believe it, and if they can believe it, it can help you know change opinions and change behaviors. So um, the reason we do these multiple futures is because we know that there's not one single future. A lot of different things could come true, but in looking at all of these futures, we can zero in on the one we really, really, really want and what it's going to take us to get there. So with that, um, we want to open it up for some discussion from you. Um, so this would be the opportunity for you to hang on. It might be the opportunity for me to go to the question pane here. Let me just, sorry, your screen's going to go blank for just a second. All right, so yeah, got some questions here. Um, besides the audio cutting in and out, we experienced that too on our end. Hopefully that is starting to go away. Nancy Eisenbrandt, audio cutting, the sound is not working. There's a lot of audio. Oh dear. Okay, so I'm going to skip through the audio questions and see if anybody has um, thrown in a question about, awesome, audio is fine, mine is better, working on the cell phone, Nancy called back in, that's because she troubleshoots. Um, so this is a the spot in your questions, kind of en enter your questions, but I told David today, poor guy, I said, David, I'm also going to be asking you some questions. <laughs> She's like, all right, whatever. She never um, follows the rules. I know. Never, does. never, do, never do. Um, so David, while, while your colleagues are um, throwing your questions out, I want to ask you, um, and this is really the first time we've talked about this, but like, um, what about this process was like, uh-oh. And what about this process was like, whoa, that was an unintended awesome consequence. So from the kind of the the scary or ugly to the like, wow, this was this went way better than I could have imagined. Because you took a big risk. I think the uh oh um, was more about how does this process translate for a chamber of commerce who typically is all about facts and figures, makes very sense. factual here's how we're going to do things, to let's talk about the future. Right. I mean, let's talk about those things that might happen. If we might maybe do this, what right. happens? And all of a sudden, we're not dealing in the A plus B equals C. We're dealing with, well, maybe A and potentially B, but probably Z. Uh -huh. All add together <laughs> might equal Q. Right. And, you know, the, the look you got from people is like, what? Right. You want to, you know, it all made sense to them that we want to think about how to get 20 years in the future. Right. But the way you get there, through this process, it can be pretty uncomfortable for some folks. If you yeah. come in and expect to do a traditional strategic planning session, yeah. um, you don't get that. Right. I mean, you get, here's 37 potential trends that are hitting you. Tell me which of these might impact Omaha in a big way or might not even impact Omaha at all, and then debate that at your table. And you've got 70 seconds to do that. Right. <laughs> and then we'll do it. <laughs> we'll do it again. And so for people that expected some level of, of a semblance of normalcy in right. these meetings right. didn't happen. Right. Number two was that we were. This is not the traditional group of people yeah. that you would be engaging with. So, Rebecca mentioned that we had 38 different organizations um, have one-on-one -on -one meetings with her, but that discounts by a factor of 10 the number of organizations that jumped in and were part of this process to try and figure out what the preferred future for Greater Omaha should be. And the fact that we had the Urban League and the United Way involved with us gave us some license to say this isn't just about what the economy is going to look like. Yes. It's also about what the rest of the community will look like that could potentially impact the ability for the economy to look in certain ways. So all of a sudden, we were, we were talking to people from Omaha by Design and the Women's Fund and the Latino Center from the Midlands and the Urban League and the United Way. And just the number of organizations we worked with was kind of mind-boggling, so all of a sudden you may find yourself as a chamber investor okay. sitting at a table with three or four people that you would never have sat at a table before and maybe never sought their input or had a reason to seek their input right. or certainly not a reason to sit and listen to what they had to say the same way you had to say it. Yeah. So we end up with this really a uh, couple of uh-oh moments of saying, we're going to put him with them, oh my God, <laughs> or even worse, we're going to put them with him, oh no. Because, um, you know, every, every one of us have built-in skeptics in our That's community. Right. And so you had to be careful with how do you mix and match all of this but still make it random enough and real enough that you're not actually trying to create some artificial kind of process. Um, the aha moments came when, didn't matter who they were, got engaged in what the outcomes could look like. Okay, so they all had these great conversations. They all got passionate about what the community could be. 
Um, and you could see that even in the, the most skeptical person's mind, there was some value in this process for them. Mm. They could see that there was a future that they could visualize. And if everybody visualized that same future, chances are we could actually develop something that would be beneficial. Yeah. So I think that's where the big aha moment came for me is that, yeah, this is strange, this is weird, this is risky, but but we're going to get something from this we've never gotten before. And even the most skeptical among us could see that there was a positive outcome that we could get to. Oh, that's cool. That's super cool. Um, I'm going to, I'm jumping in on your um, questions here, which thank you, rock stars. Wow, look at them um, I know, right? So, Brittany, Eugene, Oregon, did Omaha have a current strategic plan that they threw out the window, or did you start with what you had and tweaked it? So when we started this process, um, we had in place, of course, the five-year economic development strategy and a, <clears throat> a chamber um, strategy that goes along side by side. The chamber is the economic development organization here, and so what our chamber does and what our economic development team does are sort of in inextricably linked. Um, similarly, United Way had just finished their 2025 goals and their strategic plan. Urban League had just finished their 20. 15 plan, I think. So all of us had some plan in place already. And then we said, despite that, we're going to create this future. And then once the future is identified, we're going to go back and see how it relates to the strategies that we already have in place. And so what we found at the chamber is that um, we wanted to take big pieces of this and um, implement it in a way we've never implemented it before, but there were some pieces that we were already doing that we could carry forward into the future. So the, the fact that we did economic development recruitment as an example, our strategy said we had to keep doing that. At least the future said we should still be doing right. some recruiting, right. just maybe changing the direction of the recruiting targets. And so we kept doing recruiting, but we're changing the targets. Um, our existing strategy talks about doing something in talent. The future talked about the importance of talent and the importance of diversity and inclusion and the importance of, of making your community sticky for talent. And so while we were doing talent initiatives, a few of them carried over into the new strategy, but there's several new ones that have come out of the future that we're now implementing. So I think the answer is, yeah, the, the, some of the large pieces of things we're working on stuck, but some of the direction that those pieces took did definitely change. Yeah. The other big thing to remember here is this was sort of a, a last minute almost acknowledgement that Rebecca and I had a conversation about. Um, Shana Forsberg, who's the head of our United Way, was trying her damnedest to try and figure out how to take her 2025 goals and fit it into the piece that was the economic development strategy at the chamber. And it was painful. It was, it was like clearly trying to make a square peg fit in a round hole without any tools to do it. Yeah. And it finally struck me that this future document that we did actually is an open source document. This was a brilliant observation. So, I did not come up with any of this. This was all him. There's this future that we all created together that wasn't necessarily saying that the chamber had to do all of this. It said the community could be this great thing if the community did this stuff. If whoever was leading all the efforts in the community could do it. And so we said, why don't we make this future this preferred future an open source document that anybody in the community can use as a directional item a directional beacon, if you will, to say, if I wanted to go somewhere and that's where I wanted to go, my organization's mission is this. Yep. How does it fit into that preferred future? And as soon as we did that, it became abundantly clear that the things that United Way was already doing that had some impact on this, they could do the same thing with their strategy that we were doing with ours. And then we would find places where we rubbed up against each other, where workforce development is a good example for both Urban League and United Way and us. We rub, it, we rub against each other in that space. We rub against each other now in diversity and inclusion. And so those are places we should be working together. That's right. And if we're not rubbing up against each other, that's okay because their mission is different than my mission. Yes. And so this preferred future became a tool that we think everybody in the community can use to develop this future. And then you can take individual pieces of it and um, depending upon what your mission is, then try and implement those pieces. Yep. The thing I want to I want to add on about this, which is just was just amazing, was this notion of this preferred future, you know, so many people had a stake in co-designing it. And when David said, like, let's make this open source, I just want you to understand, like, the doors that have now opened. So now we have the Community Foundation saying, how should we change our funding to get at this preferred future? And we've had um, 
you know, one of the biggest employers, one of the Fortune 500 employers here, who puts people on boards all across this community say, we want to bring our board members and their uh, executive directors together to talk about how they can operationalize this future with the work that they do. So this notion of having a strategy that is um, certainly championed but not guarded, like not held by these three co-authors of this, the Urban League, the Chamber, and the United Way, has been really incredible. Um, and I think tomorrow the proof will be in the pudding, yeah. you know, as we kind of see folks. So, um, hey, Kate Lufkin, in your practice in Omaha and other communities, how have you balanced your members who are ready to go, excited about change, and other members who are vehemently opposed to change in the community? No, what they don't, Omaha doesn't have any people who are changers. <laughs> You know, I think, um, I hate to say this, but we have a bit of an ignore and succeed strategy. Um, you know, change is going to happen whether people enjoy it or not. Um, I happen to enjoy change, particularly if I'm the one that's instigating it. I don't like change so much that gets foisted upon me, but if I can figure out a way to be the instigator, I'm pretty happy yeah, camper. Yeah. A lot of people are that way. And so there are a lot of people that will say, I will tell you today that they voted in favor of the bond issue that built the, the CenturyLink Center, which is our arena and convention center, back in the late 90s, when we know that only 60% of the population did. But you can't find anybody that said they voted against right. it. Um, so all those folks who were not for change back then have probably recognized that there's value in this quality of life improvement that we put in place. And we think, frankly, the same thing has happened every time we've done a five-year strategic plan. So we raise a lot of money to do our five-year economic development program. So our last campaign was a $25 million campaign over five years. Um, before that, we did two $20 million campaigns. Um, we're, we've, we're now looking at more than a $30 million campaign going forward. So we got lots of people that are writing some big checks over a five-year period to make this happen. But, you know, of, of the 3,100 3, members that we have, only 500 of them basically are funding yep. the economic development strategy. And so we have a lot of stuff that's pretty traditional that we do, that chambers do. You know, we do events, we do networking, we do lots of seminars and education, we do lots of public policy work, we do a lot of infrastructure work. And for the folks who want to see a more traditional chamber agenda, that's where they engage. Yeah. The people that want to see growth and intensity of purpose and focus on something new, those are the ones that tend to engage with us on projects like this. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have 65 organizations outside the chamber in the community that we partner with every year. And so we're used to kind of this collaboration thing. We, we like to say that we're, we're, we, we accomplish more together. And so we sort of don't dismiss those folks who don't want to see change happen, but we don't have many people um, in our organization, at least in our membership, that actively work against change. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting that there aren't people that oppose a bond issue or oppose a, a tax increase or a tax cut or a new incentive or cutting incentives. I mean, you got people on both sides of those issues all the time. But when it comes to the work that we do, for the most part, the people that we represent, the people that invest in us, are happy to see us sort of taking the, the brunt of the issue, yeah. taking on the issues for them, leading the charge, and um, seeing some positive things happen. Yeah. Hey, Kate, I want to throw in, you know, in, this, this has been a big tent strategy in Omaha, and one of the things that we did do when we ran the scenarios, you saw that cone of plausible scenarios, is we always have a group that does a watch and wait. That it's, it's designed for these people who are resistant to change. We say, all right, these trends are coming whether we like it or not. What happens if we take an approach where we don't do anything? And it's always the scenario where people midway through are like, uh, can I please get on a different yeah. team because this, this one is killing me. Like, this is just so depressing. And the other thing that I try to do, um, you know, as the, as the outsider is I warn people that this is going to make some people uncomfortable and this is going to be really ambitious. And that has a twofold message, right? The message to people who are like, mm, no change, um, it, it sort of like, it can kind of turn them off to the process a little bit, which can be useful. But for every one of those people, there are two or three other ones who are like, I have been waiting for something ambitious, or this sounds like the, exactly the kind of thing I want to be a part of. So I know you've got to appeal to all folks, um, but I, I would also say, like, don't be afraid to be ambitious because you're going to develop a lot of new fans in the process as well. Kate, there's also something to keep in mind when you have someone like Rebecca come into town, whether it's Rebecca or somebody else, you do have the ability to have someone play the foil. Yeah. So. 
you know, the old notion of a consultant with a suitcase um, can say what they need to say and then leave town. Um, in this case, if there was something really, really challenging that we knew was going to be something that needed to be said, but maybe not said by me or said by our chairman of the board, that it was something that Rebecca could say with impunity. She's a consultant, she's a futurist, it's something that needs to be said, and so we're going to say it. So um, to the extent that you had naysayers, and, and they're everywhere, um, you've also got to remember there are some things that if you're going to stick around as the chamber exec for a long time, maybe it's appropriate to have somebody else say it, mm -hmm. and then ultimately you can have the conversation that needs to be held around the fact that Rebecca may have said something that really made some people angry. Okay, that's fine. You know, we're talking about change here. We're not yeah. talking about kind of chocolate do you like. So, yeah. um, so you got to sometimes push the envelope. And frankly, we wanted her to push the envelope for us. That, that was part of the challenge. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good, it was a really good partnership. Okay, Doug, Doug Minter, with the various models that people are using, such as CEOs for Cities and the various community building models, how do these correspond with the futuristic planning, and how are they different? To sell this approach to key leaders, should we adopt the model for one sector, um, such as our entrepreneur ecosystem, and then use that process to sell it to others. So start it with a pilot almost. And then well, you know, Rebecca had already done a pilot or two um, before we kind of talked about this. Actually, we talked a lot about the Charleston right. model that you had done there and, and what it led to there. And we were originally talking about doing something that was much narrower than this, that was let's just do the economic development strategy, and which would have necessarily meant a very different process, a very different set of partners, and then as we started talking about that economic development strategy, we realized, yeah, but the chamber doesn't just do economic development, and so we need to broaden it to be much larger. Now, we even talked about carrying this statewide right. at one point, right. um, and I think, frankly, Rebecca's probably going to be involved in a statewide effort that we're going to have started here um, in the next several months. So I, I don't doubt, frankly, that a, a pilot could work, particularly if you're trying to get a, a, a collection of of key or important volunteers, um, yeah. knowledgeable about process, and supportive of moving it to a larger discussion later. Um, if you're not sure you can bring the universe on board right away, a pilot's a really good way to kind of focus attention on how this, this can work. Um, for us, the timing was right for us to do this broader, bigger program because we had to do a strategic plan for economic development anyway. So. You know, we had to do something bigger and broader, and so the narrow one would risk just really wouldn't have worked for us. But I can see situations where it would work. Yeah, and, and two things about this. One is, like, you know, David and I have the benefit of having known each other for a long time, and that has, in a lot of ways, like, kind of made this, help make this process what it has needed to be mm -hmm. because we've been able to bounce things off of each other. You know, like I remember when I called you and I said, what do you think about having the Urban League as a partner in this because there really is no, you know, preferred future where we're not a more diverse community and David was really open to that and, and it's been a series of those conversations back and forth about, and this to get to your point, Doug, is what needs to happen in this community? So you know your community best. I mean, if, if the entrepreneurial ecosystem is the place where something needs to happen, then do that. In Omaha, you know, David has enough clout in this community that he can say to the broader business community, I think this is the process that we need to use to move forward. So you know your influence in the community, you know what your community needs. And frankly, you know, whether it's the CEOs for Cities process or whether it's strategic foresight, whatever it is, what I would just say is, like, pick one. You know, pick one. Because if you spend a lot of your time trying to figure out the pluses and the minuses, you're going to be stuck. And I really feel like there is, chambers are sitting in a moment right now. We just talked about this morning. The right is moving further to the right. The left is moving further to the left. And that creates a huge opening for trusted conveners like chambers to get in there and do what needs, needs to be done. Okay, enough of my soapbox. So Bill Allen. So what kind of program did you, jettis did you jettison, and what did you add to assist you in reaching your long-term vision? Oh, boy. Where do we start? Now? Really? So I think the, um, the ads are easier than the jettisons, <clears throat> frankly. I think the – well, I'll talk about the jettisons. The jettisons, in many ways, were, were directional. So instead of targeting certain kinds of businesses, we targeted a set of different ones. Um, that still had a fit in our structure but went from a quality rather than quantity perspective. So we set goals every five years for how many billions of dollars in investment and how many tens of thousands of jobs. And um, our goal was just to sort of have those 
jobs be at or above the median wage in a county within which they were, they were corrected or existed. Well, in this particular case, we said we want higher paying jobs, and so now we're going to measure those $50,000 a year jobs or more. Mm -hmm. And so how many of those are we going to commit to producing? And what industries are they going to be in? And what changes are we going to have to make in our small business and entrepreneurship and business retention, expansion, recruitment, even our international work? What changes are we going to have to make in those scenarios in order to target this whole new list of a uh, whole new list, a more aggressively used recruitment list, um, and actually making a decision even that instead of giving um, a, a diamond level response to every RFP we get from economic development, irrespective of the kind of company, the kind of jobs, the wages they pay, we're now going to prioritize the kind of responses we give to those that have the higher value add. That's a, a big decision for us to make to say we're going to treat some economic development prospects differently than others. So some of it was, as I just described, process. Some of it was definitely content. So on the, on the people side of our agenda, our agenda came down to business growth, people, and place. And the three of those added together end up with relative prosperity for everybody in the region. And if you look at each of those pieces of it, they all relate back to each other in some way or another. One of the big issues here was diversity and inclusion. By 2050, we know we'll be a majority non-white population in this region. Today, we're about an 80% white population in this region. So you can see the dramatic shift that's going to happen between now and 2050. We, we said uniformly, we're not ready for that. And we know it's not going to happen overnight, but we also realize that our boardrooms don't look like that, and our C-suites don't look like that, and our middle management doesn't look like that, and our nonprofit boards don't look like that, and our nonprofit directors don't look like that. So what do we have to change in order to make this important? And so now in our economic development strategy, there's a key bullet that says the business community is going to be driving diversity and inclusion programs across this community. Holy camoly, if you had told me that when we started this thing, um, I would have said that's probably not going to be one of our top five. It'll be important across all of them, but every single meeting we've had to refine this final product, the business leaders have said, no, you need to elevate diversity and inclusion yep. even higher. Go higher, go higher, go higher. So I would suggest our role in the talent strategy has enhanced dramatically. We'll end up having more people and more resources spent on talent. And the focus on place has been interesting because, you know, chambers don't have any authority to do anything. I mean, we can't, we can't pave a road. No. We can't pass a law. We can't kill an ordinance. We can't do anything other than through our influence. And yet now we're saying that we've got to pay attention to what place looks like. And we want to be an inspiring place. We want to have remarkable places. Well, how does the business community make sure that happens? Well, just think about all the philanthropic giving that businesses are engaged in or, or foundations are engaged in. We can have a role in kind of guiding their giving. We can have a role in guiding their planning. And so all of a sudden, we find our, ourselves in this, I'll call it a community development role yeah. in a way we never planned ourselves to be in, a workforce development role that really elevates us to actually be having to create the workforce of the future with partners across the community and doing all that so that the economy will grow at a rate that is almost twice what it is now by 2020 or by 2040 um, and a population growth rate increase that almost doubles our population growth rate between now and then too. Think about the chamber taking on that responsibility. By 2040, we'll double our population growth rate, double our GDP growth rate, uh, increase the number of jobs by a dramatic full that are paying $50,000 or more a year. So there's some pretty substantive changes that came into our new strategy. Again, some of it to tweak from the directions we were in before, but some of it is fundamentally new stuff that we probably wouldn't have gotten. I know we wouldn't have gotten to if we had uh, just stuck with our old five-year strategic planning process. Yeah. You know, I remember being kind of midway through, and the the story of the future was beginning to pixelate, and I had to do an update to David's board, and I said, all right, here's what I think is going to be true about this plan. What you're doing is not going to change that much. You know, it's, economic development is like mowing the lawn, like you just got to keep doing it, right? But how you do it is going to be pretty significantly different, and um, and that, that ended up being true. Yeah. You know, the how really did change. Well, on the economic development side, the other big change is we, we have a goal of helping 100 companies start up every five years. Mm -hmm. uh, we blew that up to 250 for the next five years and realized what that meant. It meant we had to do something about access to capital. We had to do something about incubation space. We had to do something about accelerators. We had to do something to move us to a point where we could more than double 150% increase in the number of startups that we'd be responsible for seeing happen. That's a fundamental change in how your program works. That's right. 
Yeah, and this is in a, in a community where, you know, the Warren Buffett impact here of, you know, buy and hold for the long term, and his partner Charlie Munger had that famous quote about technology companies, right, that, so this is, this is not a small thing that David is talking about, but the roots of it are already here. And we gave the the big the big company community, you know, the the big Fortune thousand companies, um, kind of the first crack at it because it, in a way it's already happening. Bigs are starting to partner with little, you know, like big companies are starting to partner with startups, and those startups are starting to solve their problems. So it's happening in a very kind of an Omaha way, um, and I just want to continue to to reiterate that because while the foresight process is the same from community to community, Omaha really found its way of how it's going to get this done in the, in the same way that your community would have to find its way. Julie Granger asks, can you provide examples of some shared goals among the Chamber, United Way, and Urban League? Sure, I can do two real quick ones. Um, alleviating poverty is on United Way and Urban League's agenda. And it is in ours, too, if you understand the philosophy behind why we built our last five-year economic development strategy and called it Prosper Omaha. And we called it Prosper Omaha to remind ourselves that despite the prosperity that 80 or 90 percent of our communities is realizing today with our economy being strong, our unemployment being low, very diverse economy, all those kind of things, that there are still pockets of poverty that exist here, and those people were not benefiting from prior economic development efforts. Tangentially, they were, but there was still a, a much higher percentage of African-American unemployment in this community than, than there was white unemployment. There's a much higher Latino unemployment population here than there were in other parts of than the white unemployment rate. And so for us, a lot of our programming was about how do we make sure that everybody benefits from a growing economy. And so those two agendas that they have, alleviating poverty and us worrying about these pockets of poverty, clearly led us to a point we had to figure out a way that we could work together to create opportunities for people who are undereducated or right now underemployable to get them to a point where they were re-educated and more employable so they could actually get more um, high-paying jobs with more high-paying skills and therefore contribute to their own economic well-being as well as that of the community. And so but the two of us, all three of our organizations work together. And oh, by the way, Shauna, the head of the United Way, and Tom, the head of the Urban League, both serve on my board. Um, and I serve on the United Way cabinet, and I'm on an advisory group with Tom. And so the three of us work together on a lot of different issues, realizing that we each have a way that we can help each other accomplish something. Um, on the, there was another strategy. Oh, on, on the Urban League in particular, um, they, had a, a, they have a big issue with, um, we all have a big issue with diversity and inclusion, as I mentioned earlier. Our Young Professionals Group, which Rebecca helped us found in 2003, many, many moons ago, um, is now about, <laughs> is now about 7,000 young professionals strong that we communicate with on a pretty regular basis. And they're an aggressive uh, part of our agenda to make things happen in this community. We do a survey with them every year and ask them what are they thinking about Omaha as a place for themselves and other millennials like themselves. And we ask one question of would you be likely to recommend Omaha, the Omaha region, to some of your peers if um, to, to come and work. Yep. And what we found in that survey that we did in 2015 was that um, African American young professionals were six times less likely to recommend Omaha as a, as a place to live and work to their peers. Well, that was a problem. And so we sat down with Tom Warren, who's head of the Urban League, and we sat down with his young professional group and started talking about um, what, what those numbers actually meant. And we decided to do a joint survey, a follow-up survey, with the young professional group of the Urban League and our young professionals and ask a series of questions that were scientifically developed um, to try and get at that issue about why um, there was less likelihood by a factor of six of people referring their, their friends and families to this community. And we got those results back about um, late 2016, and we put a, a joint task force together between the two organizations um, this year. And literally just this Friday, we'll be recommending the results of that task force findings was a series of actions that would evolve into a diversity and inclusion program that would be jointly put on by the, by the Chamber and the Urban League and supported by the, by the United Way. 
um, that very strategy found its way into our preferred future response for our five-year strategy, and it's going to be part of our next five-year economic development strategy for diversity and, inclusive, diversity and inclusion. So those two things, poverty alleviation and diversity and inclusion, are just two of really a lot of examples of where the Urban League and the Chamber and United Way have enough things in common that it made sense for us to partner on this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, Stuart, this is Stuart's answer. Great question. Strategic plans used to be five years. Now we can barely forecast three years. How do we jump to 20? Well, there's a difference between a preferred future and a strategic plan. So I think strategic plans have goals and they have objectives and they have measurables that you throw in. A preferred future, frankly, is a narrative. I mean, you want a people story. a story. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> Narrative. So I mean, fancy. We want everybody to say the same story about what they want Omaha to look like. So we want them to say that it's this place where their great grandkids are having a blast. That they're going to school and getting these great educations. They're listening to kids speak multiple languages. Um, they're working in these tech companies. They're seeing all the all the kind of quality of life stuff you want to see here in town. That's the kind of future we want people to describe. And then once they do describe it. You can build a plan around how do I get there. So that's basically what we've done. We've got this really cool preferred future that says here's some things that are that could happen in this community. And what's really intriguing is here's some disruptions that have to happen in order to see that kind of a future. And they're not necessarily disruptions that are pointed right. at the chamber or pointed at the Urban League or, or, um, or United Way. They're just disruptions. And so as, as an example, one disruption was that we want to be an innovative place. If we want all of our public spaces to be innovative public spaces. How do we make that happen? Mm -hmm. Well, so one, of the rec one of the disruptions that came out was what if we create a disruption fund? What we call it an innovation yep, fund, innovation I think we call fund. it. Yep. Um, that would be funded by philanthropists and business people and individuals who want to see all of our public parks be just unique, spectacular places. And we provide funding for that through this fund. It doesn't sound like much of a disruption, but do any of you have an innovation fund in your community? I know Columbus, Indiana has got one that focuses on architectural design in their community, and it's had a huge impact on that community over the past few decades. So we just started taking pages from other people's books, or in some cases just spitwatted it and said, let's see if this will stick in the wall if anybody will take it on. But then that didn't limit it to the number of disruptions. You could, anybody could come up with a disruption that could make something happen. And then we challenged people to make those disruptions a reality. Yeah, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a cool process. Um, Andrea Bennett, Andrew Bennett, I'm sorry, can you share a little more about the story? I wonder if she may have said this, asked, asked this question before we just shared this. Maybe. Well, the story has, um, there was actually the first story was a story about Grace. Yeah. Which was a, a young 10 year old? No, she was like two going on three. She was okay, going she was really going yeah. into pre K, that's right. And it told a whole story about her and her parents and what they found when they were trying to choose a place to live. And Omaha was one of the places they were considering. And it took them through, the whole story took them through their look at different schools, at different employers, at different ways of getting around town, at different kinds of housing. I mean, it was this kind of a, almost a day in the life of Grace was her name. Um, and then we took that and made it probably less fun. <laughs> yes. 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 Put, put it into more of a, um, you know, Omaha is this inspirational yeah. place that has the string of technology wins and is known for its startup community. So it took on, I'm going to call it more chamber-esque yeah. kind of language because we needed to get And it, it to, needed to, yeah. It absolutely. needed to get there. Um, it'll be posted actually as of tomorrow. Um, it'll be posted on our website because we're announcing the, the preferred future at a, a big Outlook luncheon. Uh, we'll get the link to the folks at ACCE so you guys can go to. And it'll have the preferred future story as well as the prosperity people in place statements that were made that kind of describe the details of the story. And then also the disruptions that could take place in order to make that story happen. So we'll make sure we get the link to uh, the folks at ACCE for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who like are nerds like me, there's a fantastic book called The Storytelling Animal, and it gets at why story matters so much. Um, 
and I'm thinking about my friend Ethan, um, who came to camp, works at uh, the Law County Chamber, and he has said that that one thing, just going home and starting to tell a different story after Futurist Camp about his community, has just made a huge difference. So story matters. Um, Rebecca Martin is asking, how are you integrating the metrics of economic development, um, one year or five year plan, into the foresight plan? We really aren't. We're essentially saying that the foresight the preferred future from the strategic foresight process, um, again, tells a story about, in, a, in the case of economic development, an economy that is led by um, homegrown tech startups um, that fit within our traditional business ethic of understanding our location, um, fed by the ability to attract all the talent and keep all the talent that you want because of the quality community that we're in. So if I had to summarize the story, that's the story. So then you take those individual pieces and say, okay, how do we create that, that technology-driven, entrepreneurship-driven economy? And you backcast from that 20 years and figure out what step do I have to take today in order to take the first step towards accomplishing that, that story. And so we're now identifying the first four or five steps, basically the first four or five years that we as an organization can take to accomplish that kind of an outcome. And then the next time we'll take the next five steps, assuming we've made progress the way we want to, with the goal of being able to say, hey, 20 years ago we said this, and guess what? It, my God, it actually showed up. Or boy, were we wrong before yeah, exactly. we tried. Yeah. So but remember, remember the directional thing here. So yeah. if you get everybody doing their own strategic plans right now, let's say we got five organizations, and we're all doing traditional five-year strategic planning, and we're all, we think we're all moving in this direction. Right. If we're all off just one or two degrees from each, pretty soon after 20 years, you're all over the map and you're really not sure what you're accomplishing. Imagine though, if everybody looks at this preferred future and says, we're gonna stay within about 1% of that focus, then you've got all these organizations, they're all moving in the same direction with the policies that they're trying to create. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a real chance at accomplishing that future. Now I'd have no control over any of these other organizations and whether or not they can be engaged in this. But with our board and our volunteers having been involved in our process and carrying that with them to the other boards and communities that they serve on, I think there's a higher propensity for everybody to be kind of focused in this common direction than there was before. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of leads into Nancy Eisenbrandt's question, which is the next question. Um, you know, the talk about the projected workforce future and how how the regions how the region envisions it in 20 years and then how are organizations claiming roles to reach the preferred future if i could i want to jump on that yeah, on that do. last one you know what's been really interesting is i think because there's been a lot of activity around foresight here for the last year um you know a lot of people are like tuning in and saying hey i'm hearing about what's going on can you come in and talk to us about what's happening or they're picking up the phone because of some interest and what's ended up happening, Nancy, is a few key organizations have said, we want to, like, we're in the midst of our own strategy, and we want to figure out how what we're going to do in the next five years can line up with all this work that you've already done. So that's one of the things that's happening. Um, so the, the Community Foundation, as an example, is in the process of really rethinking what kinds of investments it makes, for what purposes, how it's going to measure that outcome. And as David mentioned, you know, this preferred future that we've created, yes, it has a lot of economic components, but it has a lot of other components, some of which, like, the Community Foundation could be very helpful uh, in saying, hey, do I have five families who would want to work, you know, five foundation families that would want to work on this particular thing? And in some ways, that work is now just starting. I mean, the, the, our preferred future is just going to the public tomorrow. Um, so, like, you know, I'm going to be meeting with Sarah Boyd next month, I think, to talk about how, you know, can, how some of that plugging in can happen. And David's having conversations like that all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, David, about the projected workforce of the future. So we've done a lot of work from a talent perspective to figure out what our current job needs are, where there are gaps of, of people available to do the kind of jobs that we have. Yeah. We know that there's 59 different occupations that are crucial to our economy and what the gap is, at least what the gap was in 2016. And so we've been working hard with education providers and training organizations and businesses and unions to try and figure out how do we fill the pipelines that we need to fill mm -hmm. to make sure, if nothing else, the systems that we have that we can manipulate in the short term are, are manipulated in the right direction. 
in doing that work, we've identified virtually everybody who's involved in workforce development in some <laughs> right. way or another. Right. And we also realize that, that not everything has to be reinvented. And so we've essentially found those places where the business community can provide the biggest bang for their buck in areas that nobody else is doing that work. So one, one big example is a thing we created last year called Career Rocket, where we created one week in April, 10,000 students from middle school through high school were given a career opportunity in a place of business or in their school um, during the first week in April. We actually end up with more than 11,000 students and more than 12,000 opportunities for them to go in the first week of April to see some kind of a career opportunity that they might not have seen otherwise. And the whole reason for that, of course, is how do we how do we expect kids to aspire to something if they've never seen it? Mm -hmm. if they don't have any example to, to, to draw from. Yeah. So we're doing it again this year. It'll be 15,000 students, and our prosper. I mean, our prospects moving forward. Um, we've identified 100,000 career opportunities over the next five years for. Um, for kids in middle school through high school, so that nothing else, the business community is showing where we need people, what those careers can yeah. look like, and getting those kids inspired because we know, frankly, that everybody who's going to work um, in the next 20 or 25 years is already born. Yeah, exactly. Nancy, one other thing that, that, that the Chamber did that was just incredibly smart, not difficult, but so wise, is they mapped out their six kind of vertical, uh, their six, well, I'm going to call them horizontals because we had them in rows. Like, what are the six sectors where we have a lot of traction in this community? A lot of jobs, a lot of traction, some clusters. And then we looked at what we believe will be the most disruptive uh, and advanced technologies or applications that have the potential to transform those six. So how will augmented reality affect STRATCOM, you know, the, the, the defense base here? How will um, artificial intelligence impact healthcare? And so we, we mapped, you know, we created a grid, and then we, we tried to identify, all right, where do we already have a little bit of uh, some seeds in the ground on this that if we poured a little more of this, you know, fertilizer and soil and a little more sunshine on it, it could go even faster. So that was the other thing when we started thinking about the workforce for the future. We looked at the assets that are already here. We crosswalked it with the technologies and the, the advanced jobs that we felt it could really restructure those industries. And I'm telling you, it's like, I feel like if you had to create bets for the future, that checkerboard of like what's going to be hot in the next five years, the next 10 years, those are really smart, you know, smart bets for that workforce of the future. So I'm seeing that it's 159. We have a few questions left. Here's what I promise we're going to do, Tanja, because I don't want to honk anybody off, step on anybody's toes. Um, yeah. I will take down David's and my responses to these final questions from Julie to the end, and we'll get those over to you, and you can circulate them uh, among the attendees if that works for you. That sounds like a plan. Cool. Well, it's been our pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, David yeah. G. Brown. My for, pleasure. Thanks for doing this, folks. I hope yeah. we're helpful. Let us know if we can be uh, helpful in answering any questions for you. Yeah, thank you so much, Rebecca. David, thank you so much for the wonderfully um, engaging and informative webinar. Everyone, we are at an end and you know, great day. And this webinar, like I said, is recorded and we will send it out. Thank you. See you guys. Hey, take care. <laughs>